Well, hello everybody. Welcome to Red Tool House. On our YouTube channel, we talk about all things homesteading and try to implement some of those things on our rural 100 acres here in southern West Virginia. Well, today I am on the rural of the rural part of our 100 acres. I'm on the back, what I call the back 40. I uh, don't know if it's really 40, but uh, this is the back side of the property. The house is about a mile that way. Uh, the pigs, the chickens, all that are, are that way, which would be uh, east of me. And so I'm up here in an area that uh, the reason why it's cleared or semi-cleared is uh, the camera is actually sitting on a um, gas right away. It's a transmission line, gas line that runs through the back corner of my property. So that's why we have this clearing here. But in this video, I want to talk about this little guy behind me. Um, not everyone may know what this uh, beauty is here, but this is the autumn olive tree. And it's really considered a bush, it's my understanding, more of a shrub, but this thing is massive. And uh, in, in looking and researching the autumn olive, they say, well, they only grow about 25 feet. Yeah, this one's darn close. So <laughs> this is a monster of a bush. And the autumn olive is considered the scourge for the American farmer right now. It is one of the most invasive plant species that we are dealing with here in the United States. So let's talk real quick about the autumn olive and as far as its history goes, where did this turkey come from? This is a Southeast Asian native. So looking at China, Japan, Korea, that's where it's a native species. Uh, of course, as with anything, thanks to globalization, it was introduced to the United States back in the 1800s. In fact, in the 1950s, it was touted as being the fix-all problem to erosion and uh, barren land or, or, or land reclamation. That, hey, plant a little autumn olive, you won't have to worry about runoff of erosion, and it'll actually start amending the soil, and you'll have all kinds of good stuff from that. That obviously didn't happen. So we'll come over here to one of this monstrosity's children here and uh, look at some of the ID of it. Well, of course, it is considered a shrub or a small tree. It grows in clumps, not a singular trunk. Uh, usually uh, it just comes straight up out of the ground and branches out in quite a, quite a few areas. It um, has a, a woody stem, sometimes silver, sometimes brown. You can see this new growth here is a little brown. has oblong leaves that... Um, that have a little bit of a ridge, definite vein definition in them. But probably the one thing that separates it from some of the other um, bushes or shrubs that look similar is the underside of the leaf really has a metallic, almost reflective sheen. And again, I don't know if the camera's picking up on that, but uh, when I'm trying to move that around, see if we can get a different, different angle there to pick up on that shininess. But it's very silvery underneath and that's the way you can really spot it from some of the um, some of the other shrubs more native shrubs in this area that uh, that could possibly look like it or be mistaken for it so it has that real silvery that's the easiest way to determine one thing it also has that's really really annoying is new branches grow out in these spikes and man they are they're like toothpick long spikes that if if I was brushing through this, um, I'm definitely going to get some pretty good scratches, get some pretty big pokes from that because these things are downright hateful. They also have, and early in the spring, they produce a flower. Obviously, we don't have flowers. Uh, we're wrapping up summer here. Uh, but they produce a lot of flowers. Uh, bees love them. Of course, with a lot of flowers comes a lot of fruit. They produce a very small berry. It's, it's red. The ones around here, they don't get super dark red. They get red and then and, um, the books call it scales, but to me it almost looks like uh, overspray. For those of you guys that do any painting, uh, uh, like automo automotive painting, you see the overspray that settles on stuff. To me, that's what it looks like because it even feels like a texture of overspray. So it looks like a red berry with somebody oversprayed some white or silver paint on it. Um, so that's how you can determine um, what a autumn olive is. Well, the autumn olive grows pretty fast, and that's one of the issues with it being so invasive is its rapid growth. So this monstrosity behind me here, you can see some of the lower branches have already died out and have fallen over because the canopy has is, is grown so high. But it grows so fast. Uh, actually, 12 years ago, Liam and I, my oldest, who's 16, 12 years ago, when he was a smaller kid, we'd come up here and camp. We'd put a tent here and camp, and there was no autumn olive around here. Um, I used to keep all this mowed, actually. I don't anymore because I don't like driving all the way back here and spending all the diesel mowing something that I can't, uh, 
I've not made it back this far yet with any of my farming operations. But so these things grow pretty fast. In fact, I don't know if you can see here, but here's a sycamore sapling that's actually gotten pretty spindly and dying out because an autumn olive has overtaken it or has shaded, shaded it out so much. And that's pretty impressive when something can, can beat out a sycamore because usually those things shoot up like crazy around here as well. So they grow very fast. So what is its issue with being an invasive species? What really makes it so invasive and such, an, such a concern? Well, I want to read from the Nature Conservancy. I thought it'd be best just to go straight to, um, to reading their source instead of trying to paraphrase. But <clears throat> they talk about the invasiveness of autumn olive. Uh, it outcompetes and displaces native plants by creating a dense shade that hinders the growth of plants that need a lot of sun. Again, we see that here. These guys are getting so thick, there's not much that can compete with this. There's not, uh, not going to be any saplings that are going to be coming up through this anytime soon. Supposedly, it can produce up to 200,000 seeds in a season, which this guy might. Um, and of course, those seeds get spread by birds. Birds love the berries, so of course they pick them up and take them and, and broadcast them all over your property. Um, of course, they also proliferate through um, additional shoots. They just get thicker and thicker, like this one just became bigger and bigger because it just kept generating more shoots. That's what makes it an issue, because even if I had come in here with a chainsaw uh, and, and cut this all flush at the ground, it's going to grow back, and not only is it going to grow back at those uh, st little stumps that I created, uh, even the roots can start uh, to send up shoots at that point. So it's going to become uh, even more prolific if I come in here and just do a chop and drop. Autumn olive is a nitrogen fixer. It, it takes atmospheric nitrogen and stores it in its roots, which again allows it to grow in some of the crappiest soils you can imagine. So back here where the gas line right away was, and you know, they came in and put this in years and years ago, it just turned a lot of topsoil over. This is going to be one of the first things that pop up. Uh, it is a pioneering species simply because it can grow in such lousy soil and it can grow fast. So it's going to beat stuff out. The Nature Conservancy mentions that even trying to burn out autumn olive can cause it to proliferate because um, you're not going to burn all the roots out. So you may come through and you know burn this out with some some fire and some fuel to get to get it going. And then you come back later and you see that this bush is twice the size because all the roots have activated and sent up shoots. In many states in the U.S. strongly discourage or even prohibit the propagation, the planting or selling of autumn olive. But it's interesting, if you Google autumn olive plants for sale, you'll see that there are some people in the United States that are trying to sell autumn olive. Curse upon you. <laughs> no, each his own, I guess. But in some states it's illegal, so don't consider this a good idea if you want to start getting into plant propagation. This would be easy to propagate, so if you're new to that whole process, you could do this one easily, but I don't recommend it. It's going to propagate well on its own. So are there any benefits to autumn olive? It sounds like I've really rained on its parade quite a bit here, but you may say, well, a nitrogen fixer, Troy, nitrogen fixers are good. Everything I read, people say, hey, nitrogen fixers are good things, right? Well, yeah, I guess. Uh, the issue with this is usually a lot of the nitrogen fixers you want to chop and drop. So I could come in here and chop and drop this and bang, there's a lot of nitrogen left uh, laying around here uh, for something else to grow up. That's the real benefit. These things are so prolific that the new shoots could come up and beat out anything I'm trying to get to take advantage of that nitrogen in the first place. I don't know that this would be a good chop and drop. Well, as the government touted back in the 50s, they weren't completely lying when they said that it, become, it can make a good erosion control. Absolutely, they do have a decent uh, rooting network it grows fast, it grows anywhere, so if you had a steep slope or something like that that you needed to control erosion, then autumn olive would take care of that. Now you can kiss that slope goodbye as far as using it for anything else, <laughs> but it's not going to erode. And last, and probably the, really the only benefit that I see of autumn olive is its fruit. A lot of people don't realize that its fruit is edible. It actually has kind of a, it teeters from sweet to more of a tart. They, the ones that I've had around here are more of a tart um, fruit, but it's a very small berry. It's a lot of work for what you get out of it. And of course it's seed or stone. It's kind of like a cherry. It has a central stone. So it's more stone than it is fruit. But if you uh, search anything on YouTube, you'll see all kinds of people that are making jellies, um, jams, all kinds of things out of autumn olive. There's even one guy that makes like uh, uh, fruit leather out of it. Uh, and they just leave the seeds in. So uh, it is edible. I've, I've consumed it. Now, what's interesting is 
this year, for some reason, none of my autumn olives produced any fruit. I'm not quite sure why that is. Um, you can see that they're growing quite well, so I don't think there's any type of blight. Um, our spring wasn't excessively dry or excessively wet, per se. It, it did come and go. But I don't have any fruit on the autumn olive here on our place. Now, just this weekend, when I was over in the eastern part of the state, the autumn olive was loaded with berries. In fact, I stopped at one point uh, and grazed a little bit on autumn olive. So it does have an edible fruit. So does edible fruit justify having autumn olive on your property? Well, I, I wouldn't necessarily say I'm going to build an autumn olive grove and, and have all this fruit to, to take advantage of. Um, maybe I'd take advantage of the fruit if it was here. Again, back where I am on this back part of the property, I'm not doing any farming operations, so I, I'm not doing anything to, to keep this at bay. Now, I could come back and burn a lot of diesel and a lot of time keeping this cut down, but I have to do it over and over again. Um, but I wouldn't necessarily want to propagate or let autumn olive flourish just for the fruit. So probably not a uh, big enough pro for me to say, hey, let's keep it around. What are the recommended eradication methods? What does extension services, government agencies, what do they recommend? Well, you can probably guess their choice is chemical eradication. In fact, some states are offering free Roundup, free glyphosate, if you want to come get it and participate in their autumn olive eradication process. Now, I'm not a big fan of chemical treatment. In fact, I said 10 years ago I was banning all herbicides on our property, as if I was doing something majestic there. Um, and I've been able to keep that promise for a while, but looking at autumn olive, that could be one thing that would sway uh, my opinion. Where I'm standing right now, where all this autumn olive is, is upstream. So anything, any runoff is going to end up down in my pig pasture area. Not too crazy about that. So as of right now, I have not resorted to using any chemical herbicide. Another option is mechanical removal. Now again, you're not going to be able to come in here and just cut it down with a chainsaw and walk away from it. You're not going to be able to do a chop and drop. Uh, you're going to have to remove those roots. So excavation, digging them up, um, whatever you've got. If it's a smaller sapling, uh, maybe pulling it up when the ground's really wet and loose in the spring could be an option. But you know, I'm not, I'm not pulling this thing up by its roots anytime soon. I'd be lucky to be able to pull that out with a tractor right now. Monster behind me, even worse. I checked out our local university's extension site, at WVU. They recommend a concentrated grazing method of cattle and goats. Uh, they, their, their theory is that the goats, of course, since the goats like higher brows and woody brows, they're going to come through and browse the autumn olive. Now, around here, I'd have to have really tall goats to get a lot of this. Uh, but they're going to keep the smaller growth at bay. Uh, and that's where you could possibly do a chop and drop and let them take care of the, the new shoots that are coming back. Uh, the goats are going to keep that in check. And the cattle are going to come through and just stomp all that down. Um, now, again... That's a pretty far stretch, and I think the only way that would work is if you had a great concentration, as they recommend, and did a ro rotational process. So in this little situation here, where I've got about a half acre of clear back here, you'd say, well, I've got to put a lot of cattle and a lot of goats on it and get them to really eat it down, get them to where um, they're not, they can't be picky and say, well, I'm going to browse all this stuff before I even look at the autumn olive. Uh, make those goats browse it all down, and of course make the cattle step in those areas to keep it in check. But then even that situation, if you move those animals off of there, it's going to come back. So you're going to be in a constant cyclical process there, unless you had better understory coming up, if you had uh, uh, better ground cover. Again, that's the thousand dollar question is, what is that better ground cover? So there's not a lot, as far as autumn olive goes, that gives you many options. So does anything eat autumn olive? Well, as a matter of fact, there are some things. You can see here, this is along a, a pretty good deer trail. I can't say anything, it's all, everything's green around here. <laughs> but there's, take my word for it, there's a pretty good deer trail right through here. And the deer have stopped and they have browsed the top of this autumn olive out. You can see they've snipped the whole top off of it there. Even broken it over. And same here. But you can see as quickly as they browse it, they browse this one limb off and then there's all kinds of limbs coming back to take its place. So um, deer aren't going to be able to keep this at bay enough. I have noticed also that Japanese beetles uh, really like autumn olive. They eat a lot of it. So if you want to bring a lot of Japanese beetles onto your place, then maybe that'll take care of it. 
Again, don't recommend that because uh, Japanese beetles will eat indiscriminately as well. Take care of everything else you have. So with autumn olive growing invasively all over the place in our state, how's it shaping up on our farm? Well, we have autumn olive in various places here as well. It's not as invasive as, um, as some people have. I have a good friend who's, whose farm is just over the hill here and he's got a ton of it. So guess where I don't have any autumn olive? If you could make a guess, there's absolutely no autumn olive in this side of my, uh, of my farm. This of course is the pig pasture. The pigs have taken care of the autumn olive almost completely. Now I won't say 100%, but they've done a really good job. In fact, there used to be a very large autumn olive bush right here. And um, I may have a video, I, I can't remember. I, you, these videos, you, after you do 200 of them, you can't remember where everything was. But I had um, a time I was down here and the autumn olive was uh, covered in berries at that point and the pigs had stripped it completely down to what they could reach. And then I simply came over and just snapped that main trunk down to, to bring the rest of it down to their height. And they just completely gutted it. So um, they took care of the autumn olive for me simply because of the fruit. Now this year where we're not having any fruiting, I don't know if they'd be eating it down as much. But a pig is one thing that can take care of autumn olive. If you have pigs and you turn them loose in an area that has a lot of autumn olive and you see that they're not really eating it as quickly as you like, uh, you can kind of do what I've always done with multiflora rows around here is take some uh, field corn or any type of feed at that point and with just handfuls toss it into the denseness of the autumn olive and the pigs can smell that sweet corn and man they'll go in there and they'll tear everything up. I've had them do that with uh, multiflora rose bushes where you get looks like tumbleweeds because they've gone in there and rooted it all out trying to get every last kernel of corn and then uh, they, they completely tear up the, the bush in the process. So if you have a lot of autumn olive on your property, do you throw in the towel? Do you set the place on fire and go somewhere else? No, no, I think as with anything, you can keep it under control. It just takes uh, more time and more effort, of course. But it's really an issue in cleared land. So an example here where I am, cleared land that I'm not doing anything with. Well, just like anything, cleared land that you leave fallow is going to grow back up something. Now, I'd prefer it not to be a full stand of autumn olive, but regardless, if it wasn't autumn olive, it would be something else that's growing back. You know where we don't see a lot of autumn olive is? In the woods. So an Appalachian hardwood forest is probably your best source of uh, keeping autumn olive at bay. So it really comes down to what are your practices? How are you going to control or mitigate regrowth of cleared land in the first place. So if it's through grazing, if it's through mechanical means, or God forbid you want to spray glyphosate all over everything, that's your choice, then you can do so. But really with autumn olive, just like any other plant species, if you leave stuff alone, it's going to take off and grow. So I wouldn't lose hope. Um, if you're going to work in an area, say, I really don't want that autumn olive to grow up then that's an area you're going to have to dedicate some time to. Whether it's mechanical means or chemical means, you're going to have to get that out of there. But it can't just stop at eliminating autumn olive. You're going to have to put something back in its place to keep it from coming right back. Uh, again, it's, it's one of those situations you run everything off and then just let it go, then something more dominant is going to come back and it's most likely going to just be a regrowth of autumn olive. So if you're going to take the time to take it out, and take the time to put something back in its place. Whether you start grazing animals there or whether you're gonna plant something, you're gonna uh, do a ground cover, you're gonna bring in a larger hardwoods that are already mature to try to beat that out. And you're just gonna to have to keep controlling that autumn olive until these things take off. Well, comment below what you all think about autumn olive if you have that issue. I don't know, uh, for our viewers outside of the United States, I don't know how much of an issue it is outside of the US, maybe it's not. I did notice in some of my research that there are actually some cultivars in Europe where they're getting better fruit production from. So maybe it's become more viable over there. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed yet, be sure to do so. And be sure to check us out on our website, redtoolhouse.com. Take care, everybody.